So, hello again. Uh, hopefully by now you have a map, perhaps on tracing paper like mine. And what I've done is I've taken all my cutouts and I've put them on another sheet of tracing paper over my base map. Uh, here's, yeah, here's my version. I'll show it up close again here. And uh, this is not the final version because we saw another level of thinking about. This is all about putting things in relation to what's going on on the site, but we haven't thought about placing things these systems in relation to each other yet and so that's what we're going to do now and again we dip into the permaculture principles to help us and uh, the first one is energy cycling this is all about connecting the outputs of one system to the inputs of another permaculture is well known for making use of waste products from other people often you'll see permaculture sites with pallets and various different things mm. There we are, these are made of pallets, and uh, making use of those things, but also what's being produced on site that could be used somewhere else. We're also thinking about that, and that's very much happening here because composting is a system which involves taking a waste product from one place and processing it so it then becomes useful somewhere else, soil, compost, uh, into the garden. Uh, and so what we've been doing here is thinking about the relationship of this here to the orchard and the conservatory where we grow a lot of things on in the spring. So this, these two here, these are our third year compost systems. So in the first year they go into, so basically anything from the garden goes into this back one. Uh, this spring, which is what we'll do, we'll be moving them all over in a few weeks time. So after a year it gets moved over into this one. Obviously this has to first be moved into these and then every spring what's in here then gets used. Uh, we sieve this and we use it either uh, for potting compost and so on in the conservatory, bringing on plants. Uh, some of it might go around plants um, or you know, for mulching, the rougher stuff, or maybe as a soil conditioner on the vegetable beds and so on. So it's thinking about the relationship of where the materials are coming from to get here um, is this a long way from where you're producing weeds? And is it also a long way from where you will use it? So if we think about putting those things together so it's less work, obviously when we're turning this compost, we're literally turning it from here to here. And there's another part of this system is that the planks lift out of the front, so we're not having to lift everything up and over. We can much more easily dig into it. So that's energy cycling, it's about connecting one system to another. We also have leaf mould here, which is another thing we're composting. And uh, we're right next to the composting toilet, and we use some of this in as part of the composting toilet process as well. So again, it's relative location, uh, energy cycling. Uh, the next one we have is cooperation. Now, this is about putting things together that work well together. So in nature, there's many examples of cooperation obviously pollinators, pollinating flowers of plants, producing fruits and seeds and so on. Um, the most famous one is plants with fungi, mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal relationships. So pretty much all of these trees is going to have a mycorrhizal fungal partner that is feeding them nutrients, various different minerals, including phosphorus. And uh, the photosynthesizers, the trees and plants are providing an exchange of sugars and lipids and those kind of things so there's a relationship there and so in our systems we're thinking about what can we put together that will help each other out and around our fruit trees here we have what we call guilds so a guild is a deliberate and a very basic level a deliberate putting together of plants um, a classic one that you'll find in orchards around britain very often is daffodils around fruit trees and yeah it looks nice but there was a practical reason for doing that. And that is that in the countryside, particularly, you have little rodents like voles that like to nibble on the roots of trees and particularly fruit trees in the winter months. And so daffodils, because the rodents don't like the smell of the daffodil bulbs, it protects the tree from the rodents. And then we have a couple of others which are related. One is edge. So edge is thinking about what is the interaction between one thing and another. So we're looking at edge in two different ways. You know, so are you trying to isolate something and reduce this exchange with the landscape? So if you're trying to 
keep something different from something else or protect it. So these, for instance, are rounded. They're not the ideal material, but they do use the least material to enclose the most compost. And so there's a logic to, I mean, spheres ultimately, but cones have a long way towards that because you can lift a cone easily off the heap because obviously as you lift it, there's the side comes separate from the heap and so on. But also this is about keeping separation. And so round things are a good way of using the least edge, least material perhaps to surround something, uh, which could be a building, for instance, you know, keep the heat in least materials, least surface area to lose heat from. Um, or do we want to cause some interactions? So that could be as simple as either having a straight path through a space, you're trying to minimize the interaction, you just want to get straight through, or do you want to slow people down and encourage interaction, in which case then you want to create a wavy path. And that links us to pattern as well, which is, this is all about shape and how nature uses shape to solve things. So again, you might use shape to put things together. Do you want to create a wavy edge where there's a lot of integration, where you have this kind of thing? So whatever this is, <laughs> might be your trees and your, some of your plants that you're using to support the trees. Do you want to be doing that or do you really want to be keeping them apart as much as possible and minimizing that interaction edge and just coming back to edge edges can be lengthened like in a pond for instance if we have a wavy edge in a pond we create more shallows for things like tadpoles and such to live in which is because the shallows are the warmer parts which warms up in the sun more easily or are we trying to minimize edge so let's have a look at a couple of methods that can help us with this process. Uh, the first one is what I call the web of connections. I'm going to put it up nice and big for you over here. And uh, what I've done is draw a circle and I've put all of the different things around the outside of the circle that I'm putting in my design. Um, I've got kitchen at the top, photovoltaic panels, washing line, garden store and so on. And I'm just going, starting at the top, and I'm going around thinking about how does this connect to that and to that and to that and I go around the whole circle and then I go to the next one and I connect that or see how that connects to everything else in the circle and because there's different kinds of connections they have different colors for the different lines so some things are connected every day some things once a week or fairly regularly some things might only be seasonal like taking compost from a compost heap and taking it to put on beds for instance uh, and some things might be permanently connected like the photovoltaic panels need to be connected to the battery in the house and so on and uh, I've also used colors for the things themselves because some things are very much fixed you can't move the solar voltaic panels <laughs> once they're in place uh, the garage is certainly fixed whereas some things could be moved like vegetable beds and so on so I've got things that are uh, movable things that are plants which are also kind of movable but perhaps wouldn't want to unless they had to uh, new structures that we haven't put up yet and so on so there's some color coding in here now I find this is most useful in the doing rather than the looking at afterwards although I can determine certain things from looking at it and certainly I can see the most connected things because they're going to have the most lines and ideally then they go in the middle of our design um, because then they've got more space around them to connect to. So that's one method and that's, that's very thorough in the sense that everything, I'm thinking about everything connecting to everything. Uh, a different method which I also like which is not a different, for, you know, it's complementary rather than this or that and that's this idea of just randomly putting things together and thinking about them. Um, so I've got a whole set of cards here which I use on my courses and they have different things on so that might be in designs and so what I'm going to do is just to shuffle these up and separate them into two separate piles so these will be all the things that you're putting in your design on these cards of course they don't have to have pictures <laughs> let's just make them look nice and then I turn over the top two 
little one from each to the top, one from each pile. So I've got hedge and trees and forest garden. And then my task is to not just look at that and go, oh, they're not connected, throw them away, but to give a significant amount of time to thinking about this relationship and remember, are there outputs from one that can support the other? Or services, so what is the hedge and trees? Well, this is a fairly obvious one because forest gardens have fruit, usually, which involves pollination. And pollinators don't like to fly. If it's wind pollinated, then that's not a problem particularly, but most fruit trees are insect pollinated. And so a forest garden tends to want some kind of shelter. So a hedge and trees, it's a bit of a no-brainer. But then we're thinking also about direction, which direction does the wind come from? So when we put things together, we also need to think about the directional relationship as well. And if you've got nitrogen fixing plants in your hedge and trees, in your hedge and your trees, then the prevailing wind can blow the leaves of those plants into your forest garden. I hope that makes sense. So. It's about putting these things, they do have a connection, but also that, that connection is directional. Let's have another look at a couple of others. Okay, so we've got beehives. Beehives with a water storage tank. Well, bees need water. Um, water, water storage tank is gonna have thermal mass. And it will also, because it has bulk, it's also going to provide some shelter. So maybe there's a relationship between the bees and the water storage tank um, because this the bees might be warmer close to a water storage tank just as this provides a thermal mass but well, you can't see it on the video can you <laughs> um, and also this is why this apricot tree which is just finishing flowering and hasn't leafed up yet so um, you probably barely see it but it's why it's close to this south facing wall because this is a beneficial relationship that we put together. And beneath the tree, there's also a collection of plants, which are part of its guild. Uh, so in here we have daffodils and some alliums, both of which are about protecting the roots of the tree from vole damage, so that one I mentioned earlier. Okay, let's do one more, <coughs> just out of interest. Outdoor fireplace and chicken shed. Hmm. Um, well, the outdoor fireplace isn't going to get used very much. There might be, there might be some useful manure and straw in making a cob structure, perhaps, but whether they would need to be really close together. Of course, the outdoor fireplace is going to be used primarily in the summer, which means that even though it will get warm, it won't necessarily be useful to chickens. Um, Chickens obviously make eggs. You might even eat the chickens <laughs> on the outdoor fireplace and so on. So there's some possibilities here. But again, I would say don't just go, oh, there's not much there. Have a think about it. One of my favorites was um, nut trees and a pond, which again, isn't an obvious thing. But in Britain, we have a lot of gray squirrels, which were originally from North America and they take nuts off trees because when the new nuts are forming that's the hungry gap for squirrels for humans our hungry gap is in the spring when we're waiting for the next veg to come through usually but for squirrels the hungry gap where they're most hungry is when the new nuts are coming through and so they'll take them before they're properly ripe and they'll start eating them at that point so we looked at this and thought actually a good place for nut trees because squirrels don't like to be on the ground and they don't like to swim particularly so if we put nut trees on an island then perhaps that's a good way to protect the nut tree so it's an opportunity to spend more time looking at specific relationships in a random way and really think creatively into that okay so next week we'll come back and we'll think about which order we're going to put all of this into practice the implementation, a little bit about maintenance planning as well. We'll see you then.